Okay, so uh, today I, I was sort of thinking of titles that we could sort of give this presentation, and I thought, okay, well, getting your head around Katana is one. Just a quick uh, room check. Who here is familiar with Katana? Actually uses it? Okay, so a couple of you. All right, so it's good. And, you know, I apologize to those that, that understand it. You may sort of not pick as uh, much up from this as those of you that are new with it. Uh, but hopefully there will be some exciting things if you haven't seen Katana 3, because that's what we'll be showing today. So other ideas for what I thought it could have called is what makes Katana special. Um, those of you in the room that use it know that you know, what it does so well, really it does better than anything else, and that sort of builds passion within the user base. And uh, the other way I could look at it is why do so many people love Katana? And it's really growing very quickly. Uh, the number of companies has sort of skyrocketed in the last couple of years. So we're really excited about what we're putting into it. And uh, you know, we're not going to stop until it's an, another sort of industry standard tool for, set for you guys. All right, so a quick primer for everybody in the room that's not so familiar with uh, Katana. So it covers the look dev and lighting. So in our portfolio, you've got Moto for doing modeling. Uh, obviously, does more than that, but it's really the form creation, Mari for texture painting and look development, and Katana is the look development and lighting uh, side of the, the pipeline. So it's a flow through everything. Katana is the collector at the end of the pipeline. The reason it exists is really this. You are not charged with pulling points, moving lights, changing shaders for any other reason than somebody has a creative vision. And your job is to get through as many of the tasks to enable that creative and deliver that creative vision. So our job is to give you guys the best tools to do so. And so everything we do is driven around the idea that you need those tools because you have, aren't being asked to deliver that creative vision. So a few things for everybody to keep in mind as we go through it, because I'm actually going to work with it live uh, through most of the presentation. And just make sure that we've got our little timer going so I don't go all, I can talk for an hour. You don't, you, you don't want to, we might have fun for an hour, but he's got to present as well. All right, so everything is a reference. This is a real big part of Katana because everything is a reference. Uh, it makes the files very lightweight, also makes it very flexible. The look is separate from the model. So basically, your animation caches that you bring in, your sets, everything else, are cataloged and brought in separate from the things that make it look like metal, glass, plastic. So those can be freely updated, which may, gives you a lot of freedom when you're not uh, bound by those two things traveling together. No graphs function as templates. So you never really want to start from scratch. Uh, you can, uh, but you're missing a great opportunity to actually reuse a lot of work the same way that working with Nuke, you can build a template and reuse a lot of your work. Nodes can be driven by rules. This is a really key, critical part. Okay? So think of it this way. You've got a crowd uh, system. You actually have all your crowd characters. You're using a rule to drive them into new layers. And then the director comes along and goes, you know what, I actually want another 500 crowd characters in that corner. And if you had to go through and manually pick them all or do any kind of work like that, that would be something that would be really, really uh, arduous. But the fact that you can actually select everything by rules and control the nodes by rules means that you don't worry about it. Most of the tools are hierarchical and procedural, meaning that you can change your mind, you can branch, you can make different changes. You'll see all this as we go in. And then in the end, it means you, you, can tr you can control the most amount of possible effort or work on your project with the least amount of effort. So you can start with broad scope changes and get down to, I want to change the shader on one bolt on a model that is one of one million in a scene. You can do it. All right, so a bit about the ecosystem. We have five great rendering partners. We have Arnold, RenderMan, V-Ray, Redshift, and 3 Delight. Uh, you'll, as you may have heard, 3 Delight is the, the rendering plugin that will be shipping with Katana 3. It uh, does not diminish the uh, contributions of any of the other four. It's just the one that worked out for our needs. Please check out the presentations by those other teams. The RenderMan team are here, the Arnold team are here, uh, talking about their latest work. It's all very exciting, and I'll leave it to them to disclose what they're up to. Getting things into Katana is a big deal. So Multiverse, Alembic, USD are your ways of getting things in. Golem and Tool Chefs with Adam's Crowd have crowd systems that are supported by Katana. And finally, Deadline, uh, Pipeline FX, Tractor, and uh, Royal Render even uh, can be set up. Pretty much anything that can issue a command line can render from Katana. 
to give you guys a good cross-section of uh, the clients, this is sort of uh, a small summary. Uh, there's a few nice big announcements that'll be coming later this year. Uh, but it gives you a good cross-section that not all the big, it's not just the big studios. People will come to us and say, we really think it's the big studios, it's a big studio tool. Well, actually, no. By company count, we actually have more medium and small studios that use Katana because of the benefits of it uh, than the larger studios. Obviously, the large studios have the majority of the licenses. And this is their work. Okay, so who's here is still in school or just getting out of school? Okay, very cool. If you're still in school, really big news for you guys. Uh, Katana plus the three delight that's included with it will be coming to our education uh, program. So if you are here at Film Academy or any other school, uh, please get in contact with your instructors if you would like them uh, to be able to offer it to you. Uh, we're not requiring schools to teach a program. If you guys just want to actually use it, uh, it will be part of what's available to your school, so uh, go ahead and let them know. All right, so a few things that you should learn about uh, Katana. Uh, it's really not hard, it's just different. How many people here are no nuke? That's the majority of you. So if you can work in nuke, the same logic of working through the node graph applies to Katana. So it's different, but it's very powerful. That's the, the key thing to keep in mind. It's a different way of working with 3D, but just like Nuke is more powerful in certain aspects of workflows than its competitors, and so is Katana. So, and then finally, to hammer the point home, if you know Nuke, you can learn Katana because it's easy. All right, so the things when you <clears throat> set out to learn Katana that you should keep in mind is that there's really kind of three parts that you need to get your head wrapped around. Ingestion, so how do you load your models? How do you load your layouts? Uh, utilizing the node graph template, so doing all your look development, lighting, uh, scene management, and then finally rendering. And so today we're really going to be looking at uh, this part, sort of the asset look development, production lighting, scene management, and so on and so forth. Uh, but there's some real cool tricks that you guys can use uh, with Maya, Moto, other things like that, that power a lot of what you can choose to do. Okay, so let's dig in. So basic node graph. I call this sort of how you get stuff done. So it looks very familiar, Sim you know, same idea as Nuke. You have backdrops, you have nodes, you can organize yourself. So uh, we see here you've got three Alembic nodes merging together, so you can basically have three large parts of sets. You could have three characters, you could have two characters in the camera, character, camera, set, it doesn't matter. Those all get merged together, you can uh, use two tools called prune and isolate to remove parts. Uh, you can create your cameras if you need them. You have a whole bunch of different materials. Uh, you can both make them as monolithic materials and network materials. You can assign your materials. You define your sequence and shot lighting. So you can basically just flow through. And then finally, uh, defining your render globals and outputting. Okay, so it may seem like it's actually a lot of things, but when you break it down to each individual part, if you kind of just work on learning those parts, you can start plugging it all together, next thing you know, you're making nice renders. Okay, let's shift gears. We'll look at something that's more on the, the look development side. So <clears throat> what I have here is a car model, uh, kindly provided by TurboSquid. So what we'll do is you can see that we're going to load it in and do a bunch of things to it, but let's actually do a quick render of it. Well, we've got one up and running. 
lo and behold, I've actually been running a live render in the background. Um, so this car is brought together uh, by these nodes. And there are some unique workflows. So I'm not going to focus on like every nit little nitty gritty. I just want to try and touch on like the points that are different about Katana that provide you opportunities. Okay. I'll also show you some of the live rendering that will sort of dovetail with what Agaliz has to, to say about uh, the three to life philosophy. <coughs> Pardon me. All right. So let's take a look at how this actually comes together. So I have an Olympic node that loads the car model. Uh, I decided that it should not really face down uh, the line there, so I just quickly rotate it with a transform tool. I then have a bunch of nodes that I'll show you in a second that uh, prepare it for uh, the viewer. So this is our new Hydra-powered viewer. It's from the Pixar USD open source project powering it. Uh, we built this on top of our uh, viewer API, so if you're working at a company or ever work at a company that has a custom viewer technology, you can just plug it in on top of Katana. A few of our clients have done that. So there's a few tricks that you can use to get that ready. Now, the other part of it is that it comes together with, we've loaded a background sweep. Now, if we actually look at this, uh, we can see that if I were to open it up here, we would see that I actually have a different model uh, where I had sort of brought this in. So to actually make use of the background sweep, I use this isolate node. So a lot of tools in Katana do exactly what they are uh, marked as. Isolate will basically say, take the thing you're giving me, which is this, and then isolate it. So let me take a step back, give you a quick uh, UI overview. So we've got the monitor, we have the viewer. Pretty simple, where pixels go, where you look at 3D things. What's happening in the node graph is like I had said before, 3D scene compositing. So I've got the car model, okay? And I want to put it together with the background. And so literally, I load the two Olympics, I can merge them together. What's happening is that, like Nuke, when you look at any of these nodes, you're looking at a different scene or scene state. Just like the same way that when you're working in Nuke, you're looking at a different image state throughout the whole chain of nodes. Which is really cool when you think about it because if you're trying to debug what's going wrong in your 3D scene, you can step back through the nodes. The way you know what's actually in the 3D scene is this outliner over here. Okay, so we've got the monitor, the viewer, the node graph, which is then creating a 3D scene. We've got the outliner, or the scene graph. We then have, for every node, it has parameters, which are controlled up here, okay? So what you're seeing here, let me actually, based on this people squinting, we could probably do with not that big. We'll dial it back. All right, that's a little bit better. Can everybody read that a little bit easier? Cool. All right, so on the parameter pane, what you can see there is that I'm actually telling it which piece of geometry. In that scene graph, everything's laid out like a, a path or a directory. So the way you interact with things in Katana is by telling the node which scene graph path you want to operate on. The cool thing is you can drag and drop, you can use expressions, or you can use collections, so Maya selection set type uh, technology. But you can also then define those by rules. So you can see as this starts to like, if you think about you know, to basically make a container called a collection, which is then fed by a rule, which is then used on an operator, you start to be able to make a node graph that is completely flexible and malleable to what you give it. So the whole idea is as much as possible, work in ways that actually allow you to reuse this template. Because then if you put new things in at the top, if I change the car to a different model, the same processing is still going to take place. So if I have production standards on what things are called, then you'll see why that goes through. And you'll see some other uh, neat tricks in a minute. Everybody following so far? Cool. All right. So all this is coming together. We merge various things together. We've uh, got some shaders. and. Again, we're still running a, a live render. 
Now, <clears throat> two things you need to keep in mind. Uh, there are two flags, one for viewing, one for editing, okay? So what happens is the purple flag, which you set with V, will then tell uh, Katana which scene graph, which 3D scene are you processing, okay? I want to create a 3D scene from the render settings node, therefore it gives me that one. If I um, work with uh, the green one, it tells me which controls. So just like Nuke, you can view from one node, edit on the other. So if you need to see the cumulative effect but up, edit an upstream uh, node, you can do so. Okay. All right. So, and then let's put this all together here. And we've got our piece together. Now, one thing you'll see, uh, not in the Katana 3.0, but in future updates, is the quality of the GL rendering is just going to go up and up and up and up. Uh, but at the same time, what we're actually doing is adding a ray trace uh, buffer to the viewer as well. So it just means that whether you're working with 3D Lite, RenderMan, Redshift, Arnold, doesn't matter, you will have a ray traced viewer. So that's sort of added uh, on top of everything that we're doing so far. All right, we're down to 10 minutes, so let's keep going through this all, because like I told you, I could keep going for a long time. All right. So let's take a look at some of the hooks that we're using here before we get into some of the 3D light specific uh, material. So do you guys wish that some of the steps that you do could be automated? Uh, maybe you're working at studios that have some scripts. Uh, but there's ways that you can use Maya or Moto and attributes on Alembic meshes to actually drive a lot of what happens in Katana. And this plays into um, what I'm about to show you. So you can see that this car here in GL has a number of different colors on it. And those are being derived uh, by, uh, basically, they're, they're procedural, OK? So what we could actually do is come into here, and I'll show you what's going on. Right. So what I have here is one of these expressions. Okay, so remember, every node always has this idea of what, it, what do I operate on. Think of it like in Nuke, if you were doing the multi-channel EXR workflow and you had the multiple channels all being fed through the EXR stream, that's what this is like. Most Katana graphs are very narrow rather than being very wide and then collecting slowly. They usually start off a little wider at the top, go very narrow very quickly, branch occasionally, come back together. You know, so it's a different way of working because you do have this laser focus or very broad application that you can make with the, the cell. All right, so what's happened is that in Moto, when I exported this, I actually tagged the parts of the geometry with attributes. So what happens is that I actually added this ABC uh, dot shader. Now in Moto, what this actually looks like is just a user channel. And literally, I just added something called shader, and then I can give it a string. In Maya, this can be the extra attributes. Uh, only difference is that the way that Maya exports them, they go into a different header or group in the uh, Katana file. So if we wanted to uh, say uh, that we wanted to make this red instead. Let's just do a quick export. And if I've got my red hooked up, so what should happen is if I come back here, and you'll see this is the beautiful thing of having everything as a reference, is that I can actually come in here. I've changed nothing. All my work is still the same. And there we go. Right? So you also have controls inside of Katana that you can use to massage these attributes 
if they didn't come in the way you want, you can bring them in as a sidecar file and apply them. But if you think about it this way, you in a 3D application could be tagging your model with any shader, any settings you want to use. So if you literally were told, you know what, I want this to be a back, it's a background asset, and I want this to be metal, I want this to be glass, I want this to be plastic, go, 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 go. You could literally in your 3D application be just tagging those things and then bring them into Katana and have all this work be applied automatically. And then you can still make updates. So I mean, it's, when it comes to look development, high quality, but high volume. That's the real key. That's where Katana like, really stands apart from everybody else, is because of these little tricks and these little tools, you can literally just blast through uh, so many things. And you can see that my live render is still going. So I can keep updating. All right, so let's get into some more fun uh, things along the way. So what has actually happened along here is that uh, we've had all that, those attributes tagged on. It's setting up the GL. So this the later will be PBR shaders. Uh, we have a set of gray shaders. So if we take it back, uh, let's do this one. Right. So here's our car with just basic gray shaders applied to it. So where do those come from? There's two types of materials inside of Katana, a basic monolithic material and a network material. Guys mainly working with Maya, Max, Houdini? Maya? All of them? Yeah. All right, so think of network materials as uh, like the Maya Hypershade. We'll just focus on one, the big one. Um, so it's where you start chaining your, you know, your file textures with your fractals, and you put all this stuff together. The difference is it's all in the one node graph. So it's the unified node graph, which allows you to do it all in one space, which is pretty cool. Um, and then what you, that gives you, though, is that you can do little things like, OK, well, here I've got the where am I? Uh, basic gray shader, which then I assign to everything. So I take it from the geometry level down. So it doesn't matter. I can start working right away. I could be going, you know what? What kind of lighting do I want to work with today? Let's see. Uh, you know, I will say that I want to uh, just work with an area light. Okay. <laughs> so you can work out your lighting. You can do whatever you want. Get that all set up. Um, but what I want to be able to say or do in this case is say, right? Well, that's all well and good. Uh, but I want to start working on the car. Now, here's the first pass of the shaders, uh, or a single shader with the texture map applied to it. Texture was done in Mari by Greg, uh, Greg Brown, one of our CS team. And what that looks like is it's pretty simple and straightforward. It's directly picking the car model and saying, OK, apply that one shader. No problem. Uh, we can get into something a little bit more elaborate in a minute if we have enough time. We're down to three minutes, so I got a motor. Right. So let's take a look at uh, what we have in here. Uh, pretty easy, straightforward workflow. Again, live render has been going the whole time. I've got a color texture map. I've got a roughness texture map. I'm simply going to take the roughness and apply it to the reflectivity roughness. There we go. Wrong roughness. OK, get a little bit more detail in there. You can see this is all grouped up. Now, one of the things that comes to mind is that, well, I don't really like the fact that uh, the glass doesn't look the way it should. So I want everything that has glass to look the way it should. So. How do I get about uh, doing that? Well, let's come in, and we'll just sort of pull this down for a sec. We're going to add a material assign. In here, I happen to have pre-made a glass shader here. So I can easily just do this. So this network material, I can drag and drop it onto this material assign which will then link it by an expression. Now, let's do what we did with the things over here. 
So what I want to do is show you how um, we used it for GL-based applications. So what we'll do here is actually copy that expression. And I'm going to bring it down to this point here. And I'm going to add a custom, add that expression. And I'm going to say that everything that has the glass tag gets the glass shader. And again, if you've set this up as a template, because you, know, you don't really want to work um, you know, from scratch all the time. So even when you have a look development, you get going on um, the template. And literally, you can just come in and start dialing in on this. Um, all right. So when it comes to some of the live rendering and the fun things, uh, what we can do is, let's say that we want to, uh, we'll mute the skylight. Let's add in a couple more area lights. Okay, so getting a little crazy with that. Now, the cool thing is what I can do with these is I can actually uh, come into the viewport here, and if I'm actually looking at the right level, I will see them all. Uh, I can come in and say, okay, let's look at the target for these. So let's move the pivot down to about there, and then let's go one by one. And say that I want to tip that one that way, tip this one as a rim light, I promise you I'm much better at lighting if I give myself the time. All right, we'll move this one back. All right, so we've got all those three done. Now what I want to do is actually work uh, with some of the tools that come with uh, Three to Light to actually shape this up. So I'm just going to cancel the live render command, quickly go to the image layers, and then I'm going to turn on multi-light. So it's pretty straightforward. You basically tell it which lights you want to work with. And that should be it. OK. Now what I do is I can set off a preview render. I'm going to bring up the three light display, which you guys might have seen before. So what's cool is happening is that that was the very easy way for three to light to then generate a light AOV per light. And so we can see that they're all quickly rendering here. All right. Now what I want to do real quick is I can say I want to start bringing things down as it's even rendering. I can also bring up the mixer panel. Uh, where is my mixer panel? Control X. Yeah, it was. It's probably hiding on me on okay, some GL. I'll, I'll, I'll show it. Yeah. All right, so the, the big thing I wanted you guys to see is that in terms of uh, innovations in the 3D rendering space, what we have here is the ability to actually come in and control the various light contributions on a, just by pulling on the image itself. The light intensities are then being fed back into uh, Katana itself. And if I had, you can see, if I turn this one off. What each of them is then doing. And that's just a nice alternative to live rendering when you actually want to sit there with the art director. Okay, so just push that to the side. I'm just running out of time. One thing I did want to show you guys very quickly, though, and is uh, how this all comes together. Take a bit more, it's fine. Okay. 
So we didn't get into doing as much look dev. It all works in live rendering. Um, this is based on the API. I expect uh, you know, the other rendering vendors, you know, the RenderMan's team's got exciting work. 3 d guys have been working their asses off. Everybody's been sort of advancing it. Um, but 3 Light and RenderMan 22 will be sort of the pinnacle of that. Uh, what we'd like you to see, though, is what you do with it afterwards. So I said everything comes separate. So we've got the car. We've done all this work. We've used the rules. We've done all the lighting. We then want to actually be able to say, hey, I want to use this elsewhere. Okay? So let's set up that scenario. So we have a thing called the look file. So the look file basically says, OK, what's your finished product, and what did it start like? Let me look at the two things, and I'm going to write out a file that says, here's all that changed. Okay? So in this case, I can write this look file. All right. So I've now very quickly exported all my look development work. Let's come to the other half of the graph, where I can actually say, you know what, I'm going to make a synthetic copy, so I now have, through this one, I've literally duplicated the car, okay? I can then come down uh, here, and I can say, you know what? For those two cars, apply that shader, or that look file. So remember, the look file will contain attribute changes, content changes, material changes, everything. So if you have the perfect look that the art director is just giving you the high five for, you look file it, you can hand it out to everybody. If it's used a thousand times in a shot, it's, you've got you know, pixel perfect representation of it. Okay? Now I can come here, I can unhide uh, this one, and if I view from that node, what we'll see is that we will have two cars. If I actually then go from look file, right? So now what we just need to do is expand that whole branch. There we go. So two cars with the exact GL settings with the exact shaders on it. So if I then uh, come back down here, and what I've done here is I've used what we call a variable switch. Uh, there's literally so much to tell you about Katana that I wish we, we had the full hour. But literally, I have a control panel here that allows me to switch between what's live and what's being baked out. And literally, I can now come in, and what we'll do is we'll just get rid of these area lights, leave it just to these two, set up a nicer camera angle, and then let's do a live render. So they're exactly the same. Wonderful thing about Katana, you can now even add nodes and start making variations. So think about this. You make an asset that gets used a 1,000 times in a scene. The art director asks you for one out of 1,000 to make a tweak. You can do it. But because it's procedural, because it's hierarchical, if he then changes his mind across all 1,000, you can go back to the source, update the look file, and move on. And without further ado, I would like to introduce the one and only. <laughs> Thank God. All right. Thank you very much, everybody. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Ariles. I'm a CTO of 3D Light. Uh, 3D Light, uh, we have been around for a long time now, 20 years almost, and um, I was there all the 20 years, so same job for 20 years. Uh, and also, um, my team, actually I have the same team, we have the same team since 20 years, which is very rare, working on the same product. So through those 20 years, you know, you go through uh, many, many phases in, uh, in, your de in development. You realize many things. And uh, today, I want to focus on one particular uh, focus point that we have right now in 3D Light that drives 
the entire development of the render engine. Okay, what do we concentrate on? Um, and uh, we have uh, less than 20 minutes. I'll try to make it fast, but I will also try to leave a couple of minutes at the end for questions if you have some. So, as you see, we uh, we introduced uh, a plugin for for Katana. And why did we do why why we wanted to do a plugin for Katana is that we find that Katana is a, is an interesting product. It's focused on lighting and rendering. And when a product is focused on one particular thing, there is a you know uh, it's a there's a streamlined process, and it's very good for us to be exactly at that point where we are concentrating on what matters for rendering. Also, the Katana needed to, to cater to smaller studios, as, uh, as uh, Jordan mentioned, and we have a good uh, co co compatibility on that, on that front. As we understand cl our clients, we have, we have uh, a history of providing uh, very, uh, how do you say, very good support to our clients. We're experts in, support, in supporting clients. We always believed that uh, uh, software industry is, uh, there is no such thing as software industry. We have a service industry. So basically, you're serving a client all the time. It's, it's the same thing as a clerk at the bank, okay? Let's not get our heads inflated because of programmers and stuff like that. We are here to serve someone, okay? Um, and um, you might have heard about 3D Light as being um, a render man compliant render that was the old days. Uh, we don't do that anymore. Okay, we're switching off to a new technology that we built from the ground up. Uh, it's called NSI. Okay, and it's an open, also an open standard. The specifications are available. Anyone can use it. And NSI, what is NSI? NSI, we call it, it's NSI for stands for Nodal Scene Interface. And it's the simplest, uh, how do you say, interface we could find to communicate from any software to a rendering software. And our entire 50, uh, 20 years of experience is behind this interface, okay? So we reduced it to 11 API calls, 10 or 11 API calls, okay, compared to the many, many tens that you have in RenderMan. So it's basically very, uh, so a very small uh, interface with some very clear rules. And it allows you to describe scenes in a very easy manner. We're also based on OSL, open shading language. So we switched some RenderMan shading language OSL to OSL uh, for its ease of use, flexibility, many reasons. We think NSI plus OSL now in Katana is, is a very good for, for a for small and bigger studios alike, okay? So, uh, the other thing about NSI is that uh, it was built for the ground up to provide li live rendering experience, okay? There is no uh, non-live and live mode in, 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 uh, in scene description in NSI. If you want it all, all live, no problem. You can do any manipulation uh, to, the, to your scene or to your parameters, and you stay in your live rendering mode, okay? Uh, and as Jordan demonstrated in his, uh, in his, um, in his 20 minutes, it was, uh, it adds to the experience in Katana, like not any other plugin can do right now in Katana. We're the most advanced plugin on that front, uh, on the live rendering front. So, I was talking about, uh, our, what, what are we focusing on? When we are focusing on the artist, okay, we removed all the clutter uh, from a from a rendering uh, parameter set, okay. Um, and to remove all the clutter, uh, you need a lot of research, okay. For example, we remove removed all the sampling parameters. Uh, yeah, uh, all the samples. We have only one quality slider for shading, which, which, which is very scary for technical people. Yeah, it's like, what? You know, what did you do? Well, we don't really need them, okay? Uh, those parameters, having been created in an era where there was not en enough research and 
Most of those parameters come from, uh, I think, um, a bit of intellectual laziness. Okay, yeah. Uh, how a parameter is created usually is that a programmer uh, is tasked with uh, some task, and uh, the 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 work unit of a par of a programmer is to expose a parameter. Okay, this is his work unit. I did this. Here is my you know here is my proof checked in. You know that my my task is advancing, and. Um, the programmer doesn't ask any questions about, uh, you know, he, a programmer would, would prefer expose a set of parameters instead of thinking, oh, how could I simplify this to my user, okay? It's much easier to, to, do, to go that route. And on the rendering side, we found ourselves uh, cluttered with uh, such users' parameters. So we did a lot of research try to scale that down, okay? And it, it, it brought us to places that we didn't expect. There's a lot of mathematics in there, a lot of physics, you know, we started to, uh, you know, uh, reread all the, the literature, and, and it's, a, it's a very hard task to simplify something, okay? Jordan showed you the multi-light output, okay? And I, I wanna just to show it quickly again here in iDisplay. Uh, oh, I don't know if you see this actually. Uh, does this work here? Yeah. Okay. So my mouse is there. Perfect. <laughs> exactly what I wanted. So uh, when we say we wanted to simplify things, we also reinvented the frame buffer, okay? Now the frame buffer is a bi directional uh, thing. You, cannot, you don't only put pixels in it, but you interact with it, okay? So this is great for artists, okay? You can, you can go and uh, adjust your lighting uh, straight, uh, straight on, your, on your final frame buffer, okay? You can cycle between your lights simply using tab and C and, you know, uh, and work with your light like this, okay? Um, you, have a, you have a contact sheet mode that sh what shows you all your rendered uh, light sources separate. And rendering, rendering them separately takes exactly the same time as rendering the final frame buffer, okay? They're all output at the same time. There is no penalty. We're talking about less than a 2% penalty, okay? So that's something we did to kind of uh, go that route of simplification for the, for the artist. Open VDBs can be used as light sources. And can the send channel in an open VDB can be output uh, output as, a, as an AOV as we saw there, okay? And you can control it too, okay? No tessellation controls. Uh, subdivision surface is always smooth. You can treat incandescent surfaces as light sources. There is no more non-sampled or sampled incandescence. It's all sampled and all uh, very nicely sampled too, okay? And we move to perception-based parameterization. This uh, affects volumes, okay? For example, if you work with volumes and you have those scattering and absorption controls, that's a very, very, very difficult to, to control, okay? And it's not controls that are needed for VFX. And those are controls are needed for in other tasks, but not in VFX, okay? You can, you can leave with just colors and what you see is what you get kind of controls. Um, this image has been rendered. Uh, we, asked, uh, we asked an artist to make an image for a previous presentation, and uh, it was nice to work with atmosphere, so many lights, uh, and you, the artist used uh, only one parameter to control all this, you know, all, 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 and one quality parameter. Of course, he used many parameters which are artistic parameters, but in the end, at the end, uh, only one quality parameter was necessary to achieve the look he wanted. Okay. So, the focus on artist um, is about usability in the end of the day. Okay. Uh, usability is one thing that doesn't get enough attention in our field anymore. Um, and compared to all, the, all other fields, uh, you know, we are really, really lacking behind. 
like uh, I remember when I started working VFX in the 90s, uh, you know, we were pretty much on the edge of things, you know? If you think about Softimage 3D uh, and compare it to what kind of browser we had by then, you know, of course, we were much more advanced in terms of usability and how the UI works and all those ideas, okay? We are, we are really not behind now. And usability is a drive of innovation, okay? And how does it drive the innovation? It's very easy. Usability drives to understanding what the artist wants, okay? And this is, yeah. And then it leads to probably simplification because the artist wants to achieve things faster and simpler without, without, you know, without uh, using so many parameters. And then this leads to innovation. And you can transpose this idea to other fields, like for example, the automotive industry or the telephone industry. Like when you want to simplify the car that it has, it, it's so simple that there's an autopilot in it, okay? Uh, well, it takes a lot of innovation to simplify to that amount, okay? This is, the simplification drives the innovation. So we don't have enough of that in our field. And uh, we have a lack of research, total lack of research in usability. All other fields have, have research in, yeah, five minutes. Okay, wow. You took a lot of time, Jordan. <laughs> um, so let me, okay, what can we talk about? Yeah, one thing that I find important, I will skip some slides, sorry. We don't have much time. But one thing that is important here is that the tools that we are making now that we are using, the, the people from school here, they're from a younger generation, they are falling into a field where we are using dinosaur software. You know, compared to what they use, with what they know about in all, uh, what you know in your life, the iPad, you know, the iPads, all the tools that you use are so advanced. And when you come to our field, you are using dinosaur software still. Okay, those those software were invented in the 90s, and they look almost the same, many of them. Okay, there was no change, and this is because because of uh, lack of research and usability. Okay, and we risk a problem which is attracting new talents. So, uh, this is a problem that we are facing. When I went out of university, going to VFX was, you know, was amazing. Now you get out of university, you will totally learn, touch a, a, a wider technological field if you go to IT, a Google, internet, or whatever. You know? it's, it changed a lot. So um, why, am why am I talking about all this, okay? is that I want to bring your attention that it's, we are a field that is ruled about by technical people, and it's important to focus more on the, on the artist. And that's how we started. That's how VFX started. It's focusing on the artist. We wanted to provide tools to the artist. And I'll skip some points here because I don't have enough time, but why am I talking about this is that we have a role as a, a rendering a technology provider in this usability field. Because there is a lot of money, time and money that is spent on, uh, in rendering, okay? And we're at the end of the cycle. We are at the end of the, uh, the pipeline. And we receive all this data. So how can we affect, you know, uh, the embedding software? Well, depending on, that, on the parameters that we expose, we can make that software easier. I can feel that we're already affecting Katana a bit in terms of usability, you know? So we cannot affect other pipelines like animation and modeling, but we can affect uh, lighting and, and look depth. And that's what we're trying to do with this, with this very, very tight integration. Uh, and good integration means good support. We're working on that front too with, uh, with our partners at, um, uh, at Foundry. So what's coming next in 3 for Katana? We'll work on a richer material library, okay, so you can have more uh, you know, uh, nicer materials. We want to bring, uh, we want to bring uh, non-photoreal rendering into Katana, okay? Because we have a very rich uh, tradition uh, of uh, tune rendering in Japan, okay? Uh, 3D Light is used a lot in Japan to make a lot of anime style things, and we have a good experience with the techniques they use in Japan to do those, kind, those styles, and we want to bring it into, into Katana for a wider exposure. Okay, 
uh, and we work also with our uh, partners to continue improving the user experience. So that's, you know, that's a quick summary. And if you have a question, we have maybe one or two minutes. Yeah, yeah. Turn down like one. Yeah. It's, it's less bright than like two. Yeah. You pick that pixel again. Will it take the original intensity or the intensity of like two? That's a good question. <laughs> Let's try. So, uh, well, if I go like here, oh, it's, it's difficult, I think, to. Uh, my guess is that it will take. Uh, you yeah, have to find a situation where this happens, you know? If I have two specular highlights, but I don't. Uh, I'm not sure what will happen, actually. John, I think it, it basically works on what's brightest in the screen, yeah. but you have the, the mischievous little mixer gives you the control of the bail. Oh, the mischievous mixer just appeared here. <laughs> Wait, guys. Yeah, yeah, there you it go. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, he appeared crazily. So yeah, you have this uh, mute thing too, where you can, you know, uh, mono. Uh, the mono is basically as a, as a sound mixer, you know? You have the mono, if you click again, you get them back, and you can just work you know, with as a usual, with a usual mixer instead of going and working with the uh, uh, with the thing. That would be an interesting usability question. What would yeah. the artist expect to happen? Yeah, the exactly. But we spent we spent so much time on this thing. Uh, I think if you use it, you'll like it, and it it's, it has been built to be used in without the mixer. Uh, it used to be uh, like you, you on full screen with dark, you know, so you don't have any. The idea between, be behind this was uh, as you paint something, you know? So a pure experience of lighting without any, th any noise around. That's where it came from. So that's w philosophically where we go, you know, when we design tools like this. And when I spoke about the ray tracing to the viewer, you know, philosophically, Katana is going in that direction with 3D Light and with RenderMan and with Arnold and to basically put you back on top of the image.